last minute. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Rhonda Mays, Principal Flute with the Arkansas Philharmonic Orchestra. I'm pleased to be able to share the next 30 minutes with you. Before I get started, I want to invite you to a wonderful event hosted by our maestro Stephen Bias. It's the H.J. and Dolores Bartizal Memorial Concert, Broadway Bound. That will be live from the Arkansas Philharmonic Facebook page on Sunday, August 16th at 7 p.m. You can sign up for a ticket to get a streaming link. Don't miss it. It'll be great. Please post any questions or comments, and I'll watch for them. I'll try to answer as we go. I'd like to keep this as informal as possible. I'm very pleased to be able to share a favorite composer with you. Besides being a composer, Catherine Hoover was a flutist, a teacher, an entrepreneur, a poet, and a friend. I first met her at a National Flute Association convention in Phoenix, Arizona in 1998. I'm embarrassed to admit that the reason we met was be because we were both attending a session and had the same dress on. I knew who she was, and so when I saw her in that dress, I tried to be inconspicuous and sat in the back. I didn't make it out of that session before she caught me, though. She walked over to me, and I, I remember being very nervous, and she pointed at my dress and said, good taste, and that was that. We laughed, and then I met her again, formally, a few year years later in Spain. That was in 2005 at a College Music Society event. We sat on a bus together during a tour to Segovia. She was very interested in listening to every kind of music Spain had to offer. During that week, we stopped to listen whenever we heard castanets. The flamenco dancers are captivating. We also sat outside a building and listened to some Moroccan music that was just mesmerizing. We heard so many things. We viewed history. We explored. At the end of the week, I casually asked her if she would be interested in coming to Arkansas to give a class for us, and she quickly agreed. After that trip, we kept in touch, and I invited her to come to Arkansas. I think that was in 2008. She gave classes for our composition students and for my flute students who were playing her music. My students performed half of the last recital, all of her works, of course, and then she performed the end, the second half of the recital. It was a really magical event. We kept in touch on and off until she passed in September of 2018. That was such a shock for me. Catherine was, always seemed so bigger than life and so vibrant. She had a wonderful sense of humor. And she was always the champion of the underdog, especially women composers. She sponsored festivals for women composers from the past and the present, many festivals. She was inspirational to me. Catherine was born into a non-musical family in West Virginia. When her parents moved to Philadelphia in, in her early teens, Catherine started to play the flute. She also learned to play the piano. Although I was told she learned to, to read music before she learned to read words. Her parents, her mom was an artist, her father was a scientist. They didn't want her to become a musician. So when she started into college, it wasn't as a music major. But because music had been such a huge part of her life growing up, in her third year, she transferred to Eastman, where she studied with Joseph Mariano. I'm sure he was responsible for her lush, rich sound. She graduated with a Bachelor of Music in Music Therapy, oh, I'll try again, Music Theory, and a Performer's Certificate in Flute. She later taught music theory at the Manhattan School for 15 years. 
At the same time she was teaching, she also earned a Master of Music from the Manhattan School. At the same time she was teaching and earning her degree, she taught flute at the Juilliard Prep School and some other, other smaller schools in the area. At some point, she studied privately with William Kincaid before she moved to New York. She once told me that her musical preparation for college was mediocre. Her composition lessons in college were abysmal. No one took women composers seriously, but her flute lessons from Mariano on were wonderful. She was a really terrific player. She concertized frequently. I think the fact that she played so well certainly helped her compose. She was very discouraged about being a composer for many years. In 1987, finally, many years after she had graduated from college, her work, Medieval Suite, won the National Flute Association's newly published Music Award. But, in fact, her first big hit was in 1990, Cocopelli, which was also the first piece that she published by her own publishing company, Papagena Press. That was many years after she graduated from college. That piece won the National Flute Association New Composition Award in 1991 and launched her career as a composer. Now, it has sold more than 12,000 copies. Finally, she was recognized as a serious composer, and in 1994, she was awarded the, the American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Composition. She wrote for more than flute. In fact, her first successful composition was a violin duet, but her flute works are special. Flutists love her work, and much of it has become standard in the repertoire. Ten of her works have won National Flute Association newly published music awards. Her music almost always tells a story. Cocopelli, which incidentally is the name of the hunchback flute player that is popularized um, in the Southwest, was inspired by the Hopi tribe in the Southwest. She was often inspired in writing her music by poetry, by art, by legends, by culture. She incorporated non-Western, non-classical elements into her pieces in a style that is challenging for the performer, but enchanting for the listener. Catherine became fascinated with the beautiful flute music of Native Americans. Several of her solo flute works are influenced by the sound of this beautiful instrument. I'm also fascinated by the sound of the instrument. I dabble in several non-Western flutes, and the Native American flute is one of my favorites. I'm going, I have a Native American flute here. This particular flute I bought about 14 years ago in Santa Fe. Um, the maker of the flute was a wonderful musician. It's um, made of cedar and has five holes and making it play a minor pentatonic scale. Interestingly enough, there are many names for this flute throughout history. The American Indian courting flute, the courting flute, Grandfather's flute, Native American flute. The names go on and on. Various iterations of the instrument were found in a wide area of language groups and geographic areas. I love some of the legends of the origins of this instrument. My favorite is the story of the woodpecker who pecked holes in a hollow branch looking for termites. When the wind blew through those holes, it made a sound and the people nearby heard it and there, thereby made replicas of the woodpecker's very primitive instrument. 
Most Native American flutes have two air chambers, one that receives the air and directs the air into the second chamber, um, the sound chamber. The flutes are made from di many different instruments, including wood, bone, bamboo, and even mud. They can have zero holes, up to seven holes. The flutes vary depending on the region and the people. Here are two other examples of Native American flutes. As you can see, that uh, if I can get it close enough, this one, the top of it, looks much different than this one. This one also has five holes and plays a pentatonic scale, and it's lower pitched because it's longer. This is also a Native American flute that is, has six holes. It's decorated um, like a totem pole, and this one happens to come from the Pacific Northwest. There are various performance practices associated with an instrument. It, it's relatively easy to play, and it's become popular in the last few decades. You most likely have heard Native Amer American flutes um, related to, to yoga, meditation, or music therapy. The tongue is not used in the same way that a Western classical flutist uses the tongue. The articulations of notes are done predominantly with the fingers approaching a note, a principal note, from above or below and or with breath pulses. The flute is generally played today with more of a new age feel than was traditional. There, there are a few recordings of traditional Native American flutists. Some of these recordings are under legal protection and not available to the public. Like I said earlier, Catherine Hoover was fascinated with the sound and the performance practices surrounding the Native American flute. I'm going to play one of her compositions that is related to Cocapelli, but not Cocapelli. It's called Winter Spirits, which was influenced by the traditions and legends of the Native American flute and flute player. I'm, I'll read what Catherine says about this particular piece. Winter Spirits. There is a picture by the marvelous artist Maria Buckfink of a Native American flute player. From his notes rises a cloud of kachinas and totem spirits. This piece has also risen from his notes, and it is indeed influenced by Native American music. The idea of the flute invoking beneficial spirits, be they kachinas or any others, is a very natural one. Such spirits are an accepted and valued part in life in most of the world. And the flute has been used to honor and invite their presence for countless ages. This is a beautiful haunting work, mostly pentatonic, without meter or key signature. I'll get situated and, and play Winter Spirits. On the Western classical flute.
And that was Catherine Huber's Winter Spirits. It's one of my favorite pieces. I hope you get the opportunity to hear some of other Catherine Huber's other pieces. There's a wonderful YouTube video of Catherine performing Cocapelli. She chooses the images that are displayed during the performance and it certainly gives you an insight into her thoughts about the piece. She is a magical composer and I certainly miss her. I miss her friendship. Since this is happy hour, I have been asked to share a recipe for my favorite cocktail. Honestly, that was the hardest part of this assignment for me. And I was trying to tie in um, the composer, the piece, and the cocktail, which I just struggled to do. And then I remembered sangria which I haven't made in quite a while. I thought it was quite appropriate that since I formally met Catherine in Spain, my husband Bob introduced me to Sangria 20 years ago. We were living at Cambridge you know, in the UK and in March I discovered that I suffered from the seasonal affective disorder. That's a type of de depression related to changes in season. I'd never suffered with it before, before living in England, and I, 
Since then, I've discovered I like light and especially the sunshine. During the winter months in Cambridge, it would get light, fully light, about 10 o'clock in the morning, and it would be dark by 3.30 in the afternoon. And that got to me. Every time I came home, I would flip on all the lights I could find. So in March, after months of short days and dreary rainy days, Bob booked a flight, a holiday in Barcelona. Well, actually it was in Salou, which is right on the Mediterranean. I was introduced to Sangria on the beach and I've been hooked ever since. We enjoyed a week of the three S's, sunshine, siestas, and sangria. There were many sangrias that week, some that I didn't particularly like. I don't really like sweet drinks that well, so this recipe isn't that sweet. We've tried many different, we tried many, many different sangrias in Spain. This is the one I liked best. Okay, one lemon, one lime, one orange, one and a half cups of rum. The recipe calls for one half cup of sugar, but I only used a quarter because I'm not a big fan of sweet drinks. One bottle of dry red wine, and I'm, I chose a Spanish red wine for this, and one cup of orange juice. Cut the lemon, the lime, and the, the orange into thin slices. You refrigerate it with the, um, the rum and the sugar in a glass pitcher. You chill, and just when you're ready to serve it, you pour in the orange juice. And the entire bottle of red wine. This is great with paella. So that is my favorite recipe for sangria. Just so you know, um, you can use lemon lime soda to give it a little bit of a uh, carbonation. Um, you can use different juices and you can use a lot of different, a lot of people put um, triple sec in it and um, different uh, fruits. Some fruits soak up the, the rum and therefore it isn't as good. So that is my presentation, my happy hour for this week and Thank you for sharing it with me.